Welcome, kings and queens, to an exclusive, exclusive interview with the true legend of poker, Joe Cata. While poker players and fans recognize him as the 2009 World Series of Poker main event champion, tonight's conversation goes beyond those accolades. We dive into the mind of a player who thrives at the highest stakes, facing off against the best players in the world. Uncover the unique insights that make him one of the greatest poker players on the planet. A journey into the mind of a poker champion whose story transcends the felt and resonates with anyone striving for greatness. So, Joe, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I wanted to begin um, looking at your, your sweatshirt. I want to talk about... Yep, I want to talk about U of M. So let's begin with the 2023 20, College Football National Champions, the Michigan Wolverines. So what did you think of the championship game? And do you think Harbaugh might make his way back to the NFL? And if he does, what team do you want to see him play for or coach? Oh, man, I'm, I'm still on cloud nine about the Michigan game. Uh, I mean, ever since I was a little kid where I grew up watching football with my brother and dad and getting taken to the Penn State game where they – won it at the last uh the last play i just became a huge michigan fan and it's been 26 years since i seen him you know win a national championship so it doesn't even really feel real right now <laughs> uh harbaugh i've always i've always been a harbaugh supporter even through the thick and thin when people wanted him fired i'm yeah. always like i don't know what you guys are talking about you need to give this guy time like our program was in the dumpster before him right and uh every year i said he was gonna stay and even when people talk about him leaving all the time but I, I honestly think this is the year he does leave just because okay. I know he's always reiterated the fact that he he would never leave unless, you know, the program's in good hands. Right. And, you know, that's that is the case with uh, Sharon Moore. And right. then also the job uh, openings in the NFL right now are pretty crazy. And right. I think Chargers is by far the top spot. Um, right. He'll have a ton of flexibility because. He could also act almost like the GM too, if right. you know, possibly. And you know, they have Herbert as quarterback, and I just, I think he's going to the Chargers. But I mean, there's always that chance he stays. But I think this year he's going to be leaving, especially with the NCAA, how uh, him and the NCAA butt heads, and yeah. I think it's time for. It. And then also Michigan's going to be losing a lot of their seniors and okay. big pieces of their team. So I, I think he's going to leave after this year. Okay. I know I was watching Kyle Hart the other day and he was really talking about well, the amount of money he'll get paid there if he goes yeah. to California, but I don't think he's worried about money. I think he just wants to go to a program that makes the most sense for him. Yeah, I, I don't think he's worried about money either. He's never been really worried about money. He's always given his coaches more money uh, than he needed to. And uh, But, you know, you're looking at $12.5 million per year versus like $20 million per year. And uh, depending on how often, how much he wants to win a Super Bowl or get back there, you know, it's, right. who knows. Right. Now, are you a Detroit Lions fan as well? I know it's hard to be a Detroit Lions fan, but do you uh, follow them? Uh, as well? Yeah, I'm a Lions fan. I've been season ticket holder for a while now. Uh, it's kind of funny before uh, before I left Vegas this summer, I I tried to parlay my brother uh, uh, four hundred dollar um, Lions to make the Super Bowl in Michigan to win the national championship, oh. and I tried to do that at Paris, and they wouldn't let me do it. So I just did two separate bets for him, two separate, uh, and just for two hundred bucks. And I did Michigan and uh, Lions to make the Super Bowl, and he won the the Michigan one. So now, hopefully, Lions, but they're a long shot. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now, would you, as the co, as Campbell, would you have played that last game? Would you have played your starters the last game, or would you rest them? Uh, I would have probably rested them. Yeah, yeah. I know Laporta going down. It. I, I was so devastated to see that, but it sounds like he might have a slim chance of coming back this week. I don't know how likely that is. It looked like it was pretty nasty uh, knee injury. Yeah, I mean, that sucks. I mean, the odds of Philly and Dallas losing their games were pretty unlikely, so right. that's the only reason why. Right, right. Um, so you said you're a season ticket holder. What has it been like this season being there in the home games opposed to some of the seasons in the past? Oh, it's completely different atmosphere. I mean, you can just feel it in there. I mean, everyone knows that we have a good team finally, and everyone's just so pumped. Right. With Stafford coming back, this is, this is a, that Detroit, that Dallas game, it just seems like they knew exactly what they were doing. 
Um, and I don't want to talk about that too much because I'll start getting start sweating, getting hot about that. I'm still pretty hot about that. No, uh, same. Yeah, but with Stafford returning, what do you think it's going to be like for him to come back? And do you think that crowd is going to be amped up even more so because Stafford is coming back to try to beat them? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess only he can answer that. It's yeah. Uh, I actually got to meet Stafford uh, in the Bahamas. I actually got to hang out with him uh, a couple of days, him and Sam Martin. That was like really cool. I called my wife one day and uh, I had him just be on the FaceTime. So he was FaceTime her and she picked up the phone. She, was, she didn't know what to say. She didn't expect Matt Stafford to be on FaceTime with her. It was kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think um, I think he's always I mean, this is just my opinion. I think he um, felt that like lion, like a lot of Lions fans didn't like him or didn't appreciate him or like um, I think because I felt like he was taken back a little bit once he realized I was like a Lions fan. And we were like, once I met him in the Bahamas, like he kind of like was little. And it was funny when he met my friend, uh, he was from Chile and he didn't know anything about football. And I was like introducing him. I'm like, this is the quarterback for the Lions. He's like, what's a quarterback? And Stafford's (laughs) like, this guy's my new favorite person. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of emotions for him coming back probably. I mean, even for golf too, they're both came from the same teams that they're playing each other. So it should be similar. Right. It's a crazy dynamic. Do you think the Lions mm-hmm. can get it done? Or do you think – is this kind of like a toss-up to you? Uh, I think they'll get it done, but it's going to be a tough game. You know, Stafford and Nakua and Cooper Cup and Kyron Williams, that offense. And then you got Aaron Donald on defense. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a tough game. Yeah, yeah. And our uh, our past defense has not been the best this year. It's been no. pretty- our offense is incredible, but our defense – Still needs work. All right. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's dive into it. Uh, the poker questions. So, Joe, you've had an incredible journey in poker world. Uh, prior to your 2009 World Series of Poker main event victory, you had success playing online as well, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you share with us uh, what initially drew you to poker and how did your passion for the game develop over the years? Uh, I got I got pretty lucky. I mean, I've been lucky my whole life, but uh, I got pretty lucky uh, getting into poker uh, at such an early age. I mean, the moneymaker um, boom was really what did it. Like, I played a little bit poker with friends here and there, but the moneymaker boom, like, really got everyone involved in poker, and I was still really young. I think I was, like, 14 at the time. Okay. Uh, no, maybe I was a little bit older, 15. Okay. 15 or so anyway uh i got an online uh i would play with friends at school and then they would have we would have home games at like my friend's house and i started noticing you know i was pretty good and i would win a lot more than i lost and i'm like i was always really good at math growing up so like uh when i was younger like uh i was always like two or three grades ahead of math and i was always taking special so i was always really good at math and i was always really good at video games i was like a giant nerd okay. so i mean both those go pretty hand in hand Mm-hmm. And, uh, like I mostly just played, like, uh, I was, I was a really quiet kid in school and high school. Like I kind of hit a weird, awkward stage where I was really shy and I used to be really competitive. I noticed the more I was competitive, the more I would get, you know, picked on or made fun of. So I started getting really quiet and kind of going into my own shell. Okay. And I got, I found poker where I could be super competitive and compete online and, and just spend, you know, majority of my time just playing online and, at, at some some point, it just it, it really took off. And by the time I was like 16 years old, I was playing 1020 on the regular on online. Oh, my word. Wow. So you were pretty yeah. much making a, essentially making a living um, in high school. I had a lot of buddies that were doing the same. Yeah, I got uh, I got pretty lucky. Like uh, I, I started my first job when I was like 14. I was working on the table. I was a bus boy okay. and it was pretty good money. And uh I remember at some point it was just, it felt so like stupid to go into work because I would go into work, make like a hundred bucks and then come home and like win or lose a couple thousand. And I was kind of doing it for my mom for a while. Okay. And then once I had like a few hundred thousand saved up, I quit my job. And then, uh, then I, it even took off even more. And by the time I was 18, I was able to buy my first house in cash. And, uh, probably, I probably made around a half a million by the time I was like, a little bit more than half, probably around 600K by the time I was 18. And then wow, close to a million by the time I was 21. Yeah. And so your parents were aware of what was going on. They knew exactly what you were doing. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I first, my like, um, 
my dad always worked overseas. I never really grew up with my dad much, never really saw my dad. So it was basically my mom and uh, she had to get a job once my parents got divorced. And so it was basically me and my brother and my sister living together and mostly me and my brother and my mom would, she got a job at the casino and she would work nights. So I'd only see her like an hour or two of the day. But like, she was always the mom that would like um, have a lot of trust in me and like would never like punish me, but more be like disappointed. Yeah. Like if something went bad and I had a talk with her because I wasn't old enough to play online. I had to get her to start an account for me and put money on for me and to tell your mom that you're going to gamble online, especially my dad had a bad gambling problem. So she was like, not about it at all. She's like, okay. I don't want this, you know, I don't want this. And I kind of explained to her, I'm like, listen, mom, I'm like, I could go to the movies and spend money. I can go out with my friends, do whatever and spending money. Just look at this as like entertainment. I'm going to put 50 bucks on here. I have a job. It's not the end of the world if I win or lose, but if I win, you know, I can make some, if I lose, think it was just entertainment and I won't ask you a ton, you know, I won't ask you again. And when I started winning, it was kind of funny because I was kind of the supplier at school. So people will come to me and like, Hey Joe, can you send me 50 bucks? Can you send me 40 bucks? Can you send me, you know, a hundred bucks? And so at first, like I was playing, you know, 10 cent, 25 cent, five cent, 10 cent, you know, trying to work my way up right. and I'd send like, big chunks you know away to my friends and then i'll lose and then i have to tell my mom i'm like can you put 50 bucks more online for me and she would think i'm losing i'm like no you know but eventually like it just it hit a point where uh i just started winning and it it was hard not to win and I, it was kind of like rinse repeat type thing nice nice um so do you currently play online now that michigan has legalized online gambling and if so uh Where's the best action or what platforms do you prefer to play on? Uh, I took, I've been taking longer and longer breaks uh, nowadays. And I actually took a break at probably the worst time. And um, because I got sponsored by WSOP last year and I was doing really well online. Okay. But I kind of hit my like, hit my breaking point where I kind of just needed to get time away from poker just because I spent so much time in poker. It's been mm -hmm. like, I've been playing for over 20 years now. Yeah. And the money isn't as important to me. So I only play when I really want to, and I really have that competitive, um, you know, feel. So right. the last like four years, I've been very playing very minimal in poker, to be honest. Okay, all right. Um, that I was Danny on the ground who posted posted online. I think he had a losing year last year, and he he said some of the side bets were they weren't even that significant, but he had him playing at Poker Go Studio more often, and that was outside of his his normal schedule, and he kind of said yeah i i'm going to just play in these tournaments i haven't really i'm not really playing when i want to play i'm just just getting up and acting like a robot so do you feel you perform the best when you're actually yeah i've taken some time off i've stepped away a little bit now i can go in there and i give him 110 percent and really you know perform at peak performance uh yes and no um but i've kind of always prided myself on the fact that um i've never really I've never really got into poker. I've never played poker for money. Like okay. it seems weird to say that. Like the money was always great and stuff, but I really just like really enjoy the game and the competitive nature. I never even looked at it money and I'm not really like a material guy. Like, I mean, like I don't even know what to spend my money on to be honest. So it's like, it's, it's never been about the money and it's always been about like, do I want to play? Do I have time to play? And as I got older and got married and family became more important, it's like, I know there's always going to be tournaments somewhere. There's always going to be cash games. So now it's like, I feel like less compelled to play. And like, I'm just like, there's always something at a different time and I don't need the money. And, and when I, when I do play, I get hooked in where it's like, I can't just play like three hours and just stop. I have to play like 10, 12 hours or 20 oh. hours or like, it's hard for me to put it down. Like okay. I get so wrapped up in the game and I get so like almost involved in the matrix almost. And it's okay. like, so, you know, when I do start playing, it's a big commitment and I go hard, but then I also take long breaks and this okay. is kind of always how it's been. All right. Well, that's refreshing to hear because a lot of times people are just playing to make a living or just it's all, it is really about the money and like the glory. I want to hoist the trophy and, I want everybody, I'm kind of trying to prove myself. And it seems like that's exact opposite for you. It's just all about competition for you. You just, you dive into it and you go 110%. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've been, I'm also lucky that, you know, with my big scores that I, I can do that and right. that I'm not relying on uh, playing every day. But 
I don't know. Even like I've always told people that uh, winning the main event has made me a much worse poker player um, just because be- prior to the main event, I always had that attitude of like, you know, I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to, you know, really make a name for myself. I'm going to be successful. I love this. And I was kind of like, it was almost like playing a video game where you create a new character, you're leveling up, you're getting like higher and higher, you know, and it's like you're moving up the stakes and you're right. playing against better players. And that was like huge for me. And I was playing against some of the best heads up players in the world. And I was playing at some of the highest stakes. And after the main event, it was like, now I started traveling more, playing more lives, start playing less online. And then the less and less you play online, the the less comfortable I would feel playing those stakes because I know, you know, whoever I'm playing against is most likely putting in the work and the time and the studying. Okay. So like as as time got away from me or as time progressed like through the years, uh, I'm not saying I can't beat those stakes. I really don't know, but I never really wanted to put myself in that mental. Like I never wanted to grind 25, 50 or 50, 100 online after the main because like I did it like right after the main, but like a few years after, like or five years after, need to play like super big online just because I know people are putting in that work. And I mean, I've always been successful at 5, 10, 10, 20, 2, 5. So it's like, and, and I'm also at the point where I always say this, like, it feels a lot worse losing than winning. So like, say like I won 20K or lost 10K, it feel <laughs> like it would feel worse losing 10K. I don't know. It's a weird thing. Yeah. That, that's interesting that you say that because um, I'm watching a player who's young, young up and comer, a rampage, and to me it just seems like he's moving up way too fast. I don't know if he has a, a if he just wants to play the biggest games, just kind of prove himself. Um, but to see him playing like 25ks, where he's, to my information of what I've seen online, he hasn't been playing long enough to be jumping in those games. So it's yeah, uh... fresh to hear you say that. Yeah, like some of those players, though, like Rampage or like, I mean, I know a little about Rampage, um, but like they're also he had um, a big. um, What should I say? He had a lot of money come in away from the poker table. Okay. so like even if he lost, it wasn't the end of the world for him taking these shots. Okay. so like like that, when you have like a, a constant influx of cash that's coming in, you can you're more opt to take you know, more chances and, okay. and also like him being a YouTuber, like it's even gaining him more popularity and more like attention. Uh, any, you know, I'm, he, he's a good player. And, uh, I mean, I watch rampage a lot. I like watching them. It's, um, I'm a fan of rampage, but, uh, you know, it can be deceiving some of these, when you know how fast some of these people move up just because who knows what's going on outside, like whether okay. they made millions in Bitcoin or uh, whatever it may be. So it's like, you really don't know people's poker's backstory. Okay. All right. That's a great insight. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, can we dive into the mental aspect? So um, playing at the highest stakes against some of the best players in the world requires obvious, obvious mental strength. So how do you keep your mind focused and sharp during those long, grueling tournament sessions that can last for multiple games, or excuse me, multiple days like the main event? Yeah, I know poker is um, it's deceiving in the fact that like if you don't play like um, these MTTs a lot or like you're not constantly grinding like these tournaments, like you wouldn't realize how big of like um, how exhausting it is some of these long days and especially like these tournaments that last, you know, seven to 10 days and you're putting in, you know, eight, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. And then there's, you you bust that tournament and then you got to start all over at the, you know, the next tournament. Um, I guess I always pride myself in the fact that like I I never tilt and um, I'm like, I, I've been through it all where, you know, I've came back from tournaments with no chips. So a lot of times, like you see in tournaments, people get like um, anxious or they get like um, impatient that like they started with X amount of chips. And now they're at this amount of chips and they have to get it back or they're the chip leader. And now they lost a lot of chips and they need to get it back and they force things. And I think uh, some of my biggest strengths is really understanding um like amateurs and not the top professionals, like their mindset and how they're feeling and talking to them and understanding the game flow and what's going on, whether they call too much, whether they fold too much, Mm -hmm. what they think of me. So a lot of people, you know, 
some people I know that will always think that I'm up to something or I'm always trying to make a play. So, you know, these type of players aren't, you know, good to bluff. And then there's other people that are scared to get in a hand with me. So, you know, and they play their hands fast. So you can bet small. And if they don't check raise, you can really hammer later streets. So there's a lot of different strategies that I kind of like uh, take uh, against different players all the time. And the professional players, like the really, really strong, like good players that are balanced that aren't going to be doing anything that I said. I kind of just try to play as GTO as possible against them okay. and um, not really play high, super high variance. And mm -hmm. also like, again, like even those super, like those really super pros, they, they have their own idea of how I'm playing. Like they, they may think I'm not bluffing enough or whatever. So I'm kind of using that to my advantage somewhat. And uh, I don't know, I just, you know, running good in these big fields help as well too. But uh, I've, I've just always been successful at poker and um, playing live poker has been, always much easier so i just been lucky to find success at these tournaments okay um so i i spoke to laura eisenberg she's a dmv poker player and she's had quite a bit of success she won a bracelet i can't remember what year off the top of my head right now but there was one thing that she said during our interview that stuck with me and she said during her tournament breaks she kind of like gets away from everybody she doesn't want to talk about hands or anything like that um how do you use your tournament breaks uh, it depends. Um, a lot of times I'll uh, be spending the breaks with like my friends and um, a lot of them really look up to me in uh, in pokers right. and some of them I stake. So okay. a, a lot of my breaks are, you know, going over hands with, you know, some of my friends that, you know, have questions about certain spots or sure. my opinion, certain hands. And sometimes if there's no questions and there wasn't really an interesting level, we don't talk about poker at all. And we just take a walk and, you know, move our legs. Okay. How have you, have you always just kind of been really, you seem like you're very, obviously very level headed and just kind of, you don't get too high, get too low. Um, it's just, you've always been that way. Is that something you've developed through the years? Oh, no, I was, when I was, when I was a teenager, I was, I was uh, a very uh, poor loser. Okay. Like not live. Like if I played live, good game, nice hand, never like talk. But if I'm in the comfort of my own home, and I took a bad, like, I remember the first time I moved up to 2550 online and uh, it was party poker. They had, they came out with two nine handed tables. It was 2550. And I remember sitting down, I got involved where I opened like nines and a guy re-raised me and I call and the flop came like nine high. And I was like convinced this guy had aces and we got all the money in. Uh, I think it was like 10, nine, like five or something like flush draw. And I convinced this guy had aces and we got in for like 20 some K. And they don't flip over the cards. I remember the river coming in ace. I just knew it. And then the, they rolled the cards and he had aces. And it was like 20 some K. And I just remember just like picking up my ottoman and slamming it and like <laughs> breaking my desk, like breaking my mouse. I'm just like, I was such a poor sport when I was that age, like especially in the biggest spots. But, you know, once, once I got more mature and, you know, obviously winning the main event and the way I ran, it's, it's hard to really complain about how I run these days. <laughs> okay. Yeah, every, everything changed a lot. <laughs> All right. Understood. It's, okay. I look back then too, it's like, I always say I was running good because I was making a lot of money online, but yeah, still it's like, I just, I was just so competitive all the time. And that was like, like I was always really good at soccer. Like I grew up, my brother and two sisters, they played travel and I grew up at an early age playing soccer. And uh, I, I got recruited for this uh, national team when I was eight years old. Okay. And we won nationals and we stayed together for like seven years and we were like the best team in the state. And a lot of my friends went and played professional. Yeah. And uh, I always thought I was going to go somewhere in soccer. But again, like I didn't even try out for my high school team because I didn't want to like stand out. I didn't want to like be like I was the quietest kid. I was like in my own shell. I was like a really like I was going through a lot as a kid. Like uh, I was not mentally like OK. Hmm. And poker was like my way of escaping and okay. just kind of be in my world. OK. So, so um, poker is a way for you to get out. You, you're, you're a competitive person, and so you obviously you can compete at the highest level there, but it was al almost kind of like therapeutic for you as well. Yeah, like uh, I was really good at video games too. I got invited out to MLG Nationals for Halo like uh, when oh, I was young. Okay. It was hard to convince my mom to you know, travel across the country to go play a video game when I was a really <laughs> young kid. And uh, I, I remember returning to Castle Wolfenstein. I was like number one ranked in that game. So I was really good online. Like I was really like 
probably because I just spent so much time and I was so competitive. And I, I'm one of those people that like, when I do something like that's repetitious, like uh, mm-hmm. constantly like re- like my brain somehow like figures a way of like what's working, what's not working, mm-hmm. like what, like minor adjustments and stuff like that. That's kind of how like poker ended up working. Like, you know, I see what's working, what's not working, tweak things here and there until it just started really just coming in the money. Okay. Now you already um, really hit on talking about playing against the best players and your strategy, how to, you know, beat them. But in those 10K uh, events or higher, like the recent win series, um, do those players, well, first of all, is there a big difference between the win series and like the WSOP main event or other uh, events at the WSOP? And uh, do those players still make glaring mistakes that you can take advantage of? Uh, so the, the WSOP main event will uh, easily be the easiest 10K um, of the year. Like, okay. um, the, there will be no softer 10K than the main event for, for multiple reasons. One reason is there's no re-entry. Right. So like when, like, you know, people can be into it like four times 10K. So, you know, knocking out a super pro four times a lot harder, you know, than one. Right. Um, also that you got a lot of like bucket listers. So mm-hmm. people that have watched it on ESPN that grew up saying, I'm going to play that one time in my life. Or, you know, they, they start leagues or friends and they, you know, get someone to go or satellites. So, you get so many people to play a 10K that has never played a 10K or even a 1K in their life. My right. wife played the main event because we played a charity event in Chicago. It was with uh, the Wahlbergs, Donnie Wahlberg and uh, okay. Jess uh, McCarthy or whatever. Yeah. And uh, there was like 140 people and she won it. So she got a seat in the main event. Awesome. And she was, she was shitting bricks. Like, <laughs> 10 she didn't really play. It was funny. The first time... Uh, when we first started dating, she wanted to learn poker and she put $40 on Bavada. And uh, within, like, I started teaching her every day. And then at some point I started playing because I stopped going to Canada f- to play on Poker Stars. Okay. So I kind of just started, everyone's anonymous. So it's not like, you know, it's all numbers on a screen. So it's not like I'm like, by playing on her account, I was doing something like shady. Like, yeah. it's not like I have, but anyway, we ran her $40 into 260000 in three months. In three then, months? Bovada locked the money and oh, said they were no. because they said that uh, they thought I was playing on the account and um, they ended up unlocking it because I sent them this long email saying that like, you know, it's, it's pretty sexist to assume that like, you know, it's me playing just because she's a girl and there's like other people that play on this IP address and no one's ever played at the same table and you're just accusing her of being me. Like, I'm like, why would I put $40 online? Why would I play five cent, 10 cent? I'm like, you guys, there's no proof. And if you guys are going to keep this account locked, that will go, you know, public with it. And then right. sure enough, locked it. Right. Awesome. Okay. I mean, why, why is it an issue? Is it where there's stats there? And so if you were, so if you are playing on that account, but it's, it's saying that stats are somebody who is maybe not to the level that you are, is it kind of like, um, I don't know. I don't even know how to say this. Like, why would they lock the account? What is there be with what, what's they the don't want to pay? They, they don't want to pay. Okay. They just want to keep the money. Okay. And like uh and like sites like especially this was like I think in like 2015. So sites like Bavada and ACR at the time were trying to be like on the down low as much as possible. Okay. So when I was trying to get that big of a wire, they just would absolutely not do it and they wouldn't even do multiple like eight or nine K wires. Okay. Um and they said like they couldn't wire to anyone associated with poker and it was kind of weird because like we would find other people that had no association to poker like my mom's boyfriend who's basically like her husband she's been dating him for like i don't know how i don't know how long they're just not getting married but yeah. we found him who never played poker before i'm like okay i can wire the money to him mm-hmm. and sure enough Bavada found out that like we can't wire to him because it's mom's it's joe's mom's boyfriend i'm mm-hmm. like how does Bavada know this information wow like that's crazy. Yeah. So it's funny because at some point they they're like, uh, we're gonna you're gonna have to accept Bitcoin because that's the only way we're gonna do it. So I ended up getting around 250k in Bitcoin when it was at 600 dollars. So I had like 400. I had like 400 some Bitcoin. I didn't know what Bitcoin was. Do you did you hold on to it or did you take it all out? Um, hold on to some, sold okay. some along the way. I mean, I have crazy stories all along the way. Like <laughs> I remember one summer my my friend bought. 50k off me in bitcoin and by the end of the wsop summer that 50k was worth 500k it went from 1k to 10k in like 
two and a half or three months. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, what is this? Like, I, I, I was so like such a Bitcoin, like just new brilliant. And I like, when I first got, I was just like, sell, 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 just converting it to cash. Yeah. And I remember every time I like, there was this site, I forget what site I, I forget what site I use, but it was like converting Bitcoin to cash. And every time I withdrew like $9,500 in Bitcoin and sent it to my bank, mm-hmm. it'd be like 11 K 11.3. I'm like, how am I making money on these withdrawals? <laughs> I'm not. And uh, that's when I started, you know, getting more into it and holding on to some and try. I wish I had all 450 still, but right. I don't. But right. still got so, some. What is your with the? Uh, I mean, literally today. I don't know if you saw yesterday that the SEC's Twitter account got hacked and basically said that it was they had approved a Bitcoin ETF, and so that made the price. I think it jumped up for a half a second, where somebody obviously capitalized on that. Um, but with Bitcoin having and everything going on, do you have like a guess of what Bitcoin might be at the end of the year this year? No idea. No idea. I was like, I don't know. It, it can cons- Bitcoin consume me for many years. Now I kind of just take a you know, seat back on that. And I remember I used to check my Bitcoin account like all the time. Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, what is that now? What is that now? And it's like, now it's like, I, I couldn't even tell you what even Bitcoin's at. Like, I kind of just have like right. money put away and just, I don't know. I don't stress about Bitcoin too much anymore. That's refreshing. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we talked about the the mental demand of poker tournaments. Um, but let's dive into like the physicality of it as well. So poker tournaments can be physically demanding uh, with extended hours, like we mentioned before. Um, how do you prepare your body for the marathon of a tournament, maintaining peak performance throughout? Uh, I, I'm a terrible person to ask that, too, because <laughs> I don't maintain my body well and I don't do the best habits. And um, luckily for me, though, it's like uh, I have like millions of hands and I can stay in tune with the game and just my competitive nature in general. And uh <laughs> that that works well for me but um obviously i could do things that would better my results um Mm -hmm. but um i don't like i don't treat it as professionally as i should it like some people like i remember the night before the main event playing for eight and a half million dollars i was out till like 3 a.m like doing this like reality show like concert thing where i got pulled up on stage with lmfo i was like wasted the night before the main event i'm just like yeah, this is pretty dumb. Like I'm playing for, you know, eight and a half million dollars the next day and I'm freaking hung over. Were you, are you just really, just really confident in your ability and you just don't really care? And it's like, I know I can just go in, just get locked in. I don't have to do a lot. When I was uh, 21, I was literally the most confident person in mm-hmm. that I could be in poker. Like I would, I would have felt like, um, I had a good shot. Like, I'm not saying this is the case, but this is just the way I thought is like, I thought I was like, you know, would do better than Phil Ivey or I could beat him like in a long term situation because I I had no one was playing the hours that I was playing online and no one was putting in the time that I put in. Like the UB scandal, like really hurt me a lot because uh, I remember. So when I was 18, I switched to ultimate bet and the most I could put online at ultimate bet at the time was 600 bucks Mm -hmm. because it was. I finally turned 18. I put a use the debit card and that's all they let me do. And within like three months, I had 600 bucks up to like 450 K on UB. And I was playing the highest stakes and I got the 50 hundred and I lost like 160 or 170 K in like a few days against like basically one guy. And that was like being 18 years old, losing 170,000 in like a few days. It's like, what the fuck? So, uh, I, I cashed out all my money on UB and went back to 510 and grinded that for a long time again. And then I found out the UB scandal. One day I logged in, I had like an extra like 58K in my account. So I obviously got cheated for a lot of it and right. even more than 58, to be honest. But that really hurt me because it really stopped me from propelling upwards and it made me really scared to kind of get involved with the stakes again. Yeah. So I always like, from that point on, I was mostly a 5, 10, 10, 20 player after that. I never really even tried okay. to go higher. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that really messed with my confidence. Um, but now nowadays it's like even playing on these Michigan sites are super soft. Like it's impossible to lose on these sites. And when I <laughs> when every time I start back up from a long break, I'm always like am I good enough? Like, can I beat this still? Like how good are these players? Then after like, you know, a couple days of playing or a week of playing, I'm like, I feel like I'm one of the best ones on the site. So it's like, 
going in every time I go to start playing poker again, I'm I'm very I'm really not confident to be honest, and it really it really uh, I really need to build my confidence up every time, even even going out the WSB like starting off like I don't, I won't be that confident to be honest, and then it's just like it really takes you of seeing a lot of like big mistakes from people and really like I don't know just. One, like okay people really do still stink so it's like <laughs> I'm, I'm not as confident as i used to be that's for sure. and that's another reason why i don't play that big okay all right now because you are so confident um can you talk to us about uh bankroll management is that something you really utilize when you were younger and maybe you got more locked into it or you just kind of this game looks juicy i don't care what the stakes are i'm jumping in um I think um, indirectly, I've always had like a really good bankroll management. Like okay. I, I've never made like rules or like things for myself, but I, I just know through my whole online poker career, I never once did I ever have my back against the wall or mm-hmm. like, was I ever at fear of losing like a big chunk of my bankroll? Okay. Like the biggest chunk I lost in my bankroll was that 50, hundred match where I lost 170 K and I probably, I had 400 and some online, Yeah, but um, obviously I had more away from online and right. that was probably the biggest net chunk I've ever lost in my bankroll. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've always gradually moved up stakes. Like I would, I was like, when I always start, like when I would start at like two, four for the first time, I was not confident. And then like, once I started being two, four, like regularly, and I have a ton of money in my account and then I'm like, all right, let's try three, six, let's try five, 10. And once I start being those stakes, you're like, okay, let's try 10, 20. But like, moving up stakes i I'm, i was never like even at, i guess at a young age i was never like super comfortable like super confident doing it i was like comfortable with myself and thought i was good but i didn't know what the players were like always at the stakes above like you don't know what the games are like or how tough it is and then until you start playing a lot of it, you become comfortable and you're like okay i have a lot of hands i have a lot of data like i can beat these stakes i i belong here okay. so you know let's go here okay um, let's talk about balancing patience and with aggression. Um, so in high stakes poker, finding the right balance between patience and aggression is definitely crucial. Uh, how do you maintain that balance? And especially when facing world-class opponents, uh, who can exploit any weakness? Yeah. Um, so live poker and online poker are, are different. I mm-hmm. mean, it's, it's hard to say they're, it's, I mean, it's the same game, but at the same time, like, so say I'm going to play WSOP and uh, I'm playing against these people that I may never play against ever again in my life. Right. Like, I don't have to worry about um, maintaining a certain balance approach um, with, you know, mixed frequencies as much as if I'm playing millions of hands online where I'm like, okay, I should be three betting this, you know, 25% of the time. Right. I should be doing this like 40% of the time. So like... That's the thing about poker, which makes it almost like an impossible game to master is yeah. like even even like bots and like perfect GTO. It's a game of frequencies. Like there's certain things that are always 100 percent frequencies. Yes. But then there's like so many things that are just like, you know, 25 percent of the time you do this, 75 percent of the time you do this. But live poker, it's really about like, hey, I'm not going to try to be balanced here. I'm going to realize what works best against my opponent and so if I'm playing against an inexperienced opponent, whatever may work better against them, but against a professional, like a guy that's, you know, really good that, you know, will take advantage right. again, they, they still, they're not really, they can't understand my frequencies live. Like they just don't got the amount of hands. They don't see enough showdowns. Right. It's okay. impossible for them to really know what I'm up to and what I'm not up to. So a lot of, I, I base that off of is like, you know, how, how have I been playing throughout the day? Like, or how have they seen me play? So like, if I've been folding, if I've just got like, you know, a bottom end of the card distribution for an hour and I've been folding for an hour, right? you know, everyone on my team might think I'm really tight and they might just, you know, get out of my way when I try to get involved. So like when I've been pretty tight, like, you know, my three bet hands that are with frequencies, say like 20, 25%, like the ace five suited, the ace four suited and stuff like that. Now I'm three betting those hands actually at a lot higher frequency than 25% because they don't know. Yes. And then like when I'm playing a ton of hands, I'm being super aggressive and you know, there's certain people that I don't think is going to fold or whatever. Now I, you know, may call those hands at, you know, a frequency that is higher than normal. So it's really like uh, some people will um, 
make mistakes of trying to be balanced too much in live poker, but really it's, you just want to do what is going to be best long-term in that situation, or at least what you think it, it's, it's hard to really know. So it's at least what you think is best long-term. Okay. Awesome. I'm definitely that part. I am taking with me to Tunica. <laughs> that was, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so sorry. learning from your defeats now, nobody can win every single hand or every tournament. Um, can you share a memorable moment of defeat or a challenge in your poker career and how you use that to experience to grow and improve as a player? Uh, there's, I guess there's a lot of different times where I really like, um, took like situations to like, like, I remember this one hand, it's probably like, maybe like, hand was probably like nine, 10 years ago or so. And I'll still remember this hand. It's, um, I wish I remember the exact details of the hand. Um, sometimes I do, but it's kind of irrelevant. It was a spot where, um, I played against Daniel Charlotte, who I'm friends with, who's a, you know, really good, tricky, you know, uh, pro player that's been around the game forever. And I played a situation with him in a WSOP event where he opened, I like three bet aces. He called and the flop came just rag, like nine, five, two. It was like, check back, call, like turn, just blank, check back, call river, check back. And he checked raises all in. And it was a situation where there's like no draws out there. Uh, three bet pot playing super deep checks calls two times out of position, then check raises all in on the river. Like, I'm like, every time it's like a set or against an experience, it's always like, you know, it's hard for them ever to find a bluff here. Right. Yes. So I'm just like, this is a six spot. You know, I fold my hand thinking like he just always has it. And he rolls like a pair of sevens. Oh. Like, so he turned his sevens into a bluff on the river. Mm -hmm. So he kind of thought he was good the whole time. Then I think he realized like there was full equity or he might not be good. And he turned his hand to a bluff. And I got so owned in that hand where I was like, I should never be playing my hand this way. Like if I should, you know, bet, bet jam or over bet some point and just over bet jam and be doing bluffs. And like, and like, so there's certain things that where I'm like, like, I really think about a hand. I'll really run a hand. Like if, like, I think about hands like to heart a lot, like, mm -hmm. especially if I get out in a hand or I think about the hand a lot. And I think that's what really you have to do to be really successful is really kind of like, um, be obsessed with the game and be obsessed with every spot. And like, even the spots that are tricky and think mm -hmm. about all like, even if you lose a hand or if I get caught bluffing, doesn't mean I think I played the hand bad. But when I start really thinking about the hand, sometimes I do think I played it bad. Like uh, I remember the main the main event final table, I got a lot of criticism the way I ran and how lucky I got. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the hands that everyone else thought I played poorly or that I got lucky in or I thought I was really bad at mm -hmm. were hands that I thought were like fine and that I would continue to do to this day uh, mm -hmm. based on what I knew at the time. Right. And I thought I actually played hands really poorly at that table that no one even really mentioned and uh, I never like faced criticism for but I know that I played the hands bad and that they were mistakes but yeah. it just goes to show you what really like the poker community and just even just like your casual players thinks of the game um from an outside standpoint interesting interesting is there anybody that is there one person that if you want to break down a hand and you want to get another someone else's opinion, is there anyone else you go to or you just kind of all keep it to yourself? Uh, I mean, um, I'll most likely talk uh, to um, like there's no one like right now, like I would text like if I'm playing online or something about hands or anything like that. But if I'm like playing live, um, I just know so many like uh, of the, you know, big pros and like guys I really respect just always around. And like, sometimes I'll just ask them like what they think about something or I run into a later date or whatever, like uh, Ryan Reese and I are friends and I talk to him a lot about hands during the summer. Um, okay. cool. So yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I definitely run it by a lot of different people. Okay. Cool. See, everyone gets different opinions too. It's always interesting hearing everyone else's opinion because like, tricky hands that, you know, are really complicated. You're going to get a lot of different opinions. So it's interesting. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to take it off the felt for a second. Um, so away from the poker table, what kind of routine or activities do you like to do to relax or recharge uh, that has nothing to do with poker? And how important is it for you to maintain that healthy balance between poker and your personal life? Um, I, I think balance is the most important thing in life. Uh, just... I always had the, 
it was weird. I always thought like, I'm like, I look at like these NFL players, say like Barry Sanders or Calvin Johnson, or, you know, um, I'm just like wondering how they retire early when they leave all this money on the table type thing. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense for me. Like you only got a few years left where you can make this kind of money. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you retiring? Right. You know, Andrew Law, people like that. And it's like, I never really understood uh, like the life balance when you, when you, when you have that kind of money, mm-hmm. Um, the most, I think the most important thing in life is balance or what really makes you happy and not to just keep trying to accumulate. Um, right. so I never understood how those guys retire now. Now I completely understand. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm kind of the same way. I think me just always being involved in video games and being a nerd growing up. Uh, I still love video games. It's been a while since I've played something. It's weird. Okay. Like this is probably the longest drought I've been without video games, poker, g- gambling. It's weird. Uh, but normally I play a lot of video games. Uh, I play soccer still. I okay. coach soccer. I coach nice. high school boys. I coach high school boys and girls. Wow. So, uh, um, that's, that's, I, I actually in love with that. So I'm so happy I started doing that because it's like poker has always been such a selfish endeavor and, uh, been doing it for so long that it feels good that soccer was my other passion in life. And now I can, you know, teach and, you know, um, I don't know, play still and just like, you know, give back and not really give back. It just feels, it doesn't feel like a job to me. Okay. Is it it's something that you'd want to do, like go to a university and coach a team or, or just go to like the highest levels doing it or are you fine where you are now? Uh, maybe. I, I know right now that it's, I just got to put in the, the time and um, I, you know, I, another great thing about coaching is like, it's not just like you're coaching in the game of soccer. You can give them like good life advice and like, uh, you know, other things you can like it. I'm really good at talking to kids and like uh, understanding like just what, you know, it's the great thing about poker is like, uh, or thing I've always been good at poker is I can step, you know, away from myself. Like I can like look at a bird. I like not have like a biased opinion about things. Yes. And it's kind of like the same thing at soccer. I can kind of like, step back and like look at the situation and i know some kids like to be pushed some kids not some confidence you know issues some okay. need the comp you know so coaching is fun because you kind of find what makes your players tick and right. what gets them going and you know i don't know it's it's a fun thing still and i know i have a lot to learn and i like um just like poker it's like now that i'm putting my time into soccer and coaching soccer that like away from soccer i'm like watching coaching videos watching like i played soccer my whole life but i'm still watching like okay practices what what are the best drills i should be doing what drills you know and then looking at other professional coaches like in premier leagues and reading books and just trying to get better because i know like just because i played forever doesn't mean it would translate to be a good coach okay all right um so i read an article on wpt or, or world poker tour site uh last december and you mentioned potentially staying home after the wpt prime event um, so can you speak to uh, how your wife encouraged you to go back to play the, the championship event and how important is it for you to have such a support, uh, supportive family and friends um, in your support group? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's I think having my friends come and play like these tournaments with me and being there and having friends in poker mm-hmm. is like the sole reason why I still go and play like uh when I go out to the World Series of Poker for the summer, I don't know if I'm going to do it this year. Um, this might be my first summer. I don't, I don't fully commit to a full summer. Okay. But every summer in the past, it's almost like um, summer camp. It's like going, hanging out with you know my friends that live you know an hour and a half away from me at home, so I never really see them at home. Okay. And I'm sitting with these guys for 45 days, just hanging out at the house with like four of them, and just doing all fun things, just playing poker, talking poker. And it's just like the whole just like camaraderie and just the whole vibe. It's what I really enjoy. Not like being out there grinding by myself. Travel. Like I can't I can't go and play like an EBT and go to Europe and play by, travel. I just I can't do that. Like maybe if like I had a bunch of friends are like, hey, come play this EBT, you know, mm-hmm. like my friends always drag me to the tournament. So like whether it's a tournament in Florida or the win or whatever, it's mostly like my friends kind of poking at me like, hey, come play this, come play this. And I'm like, all right, you know, I never really. I never really have that itch to like, oh, what's 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 on the schedule? What's coming up in a couple months? So that that's that's really important for me. Um, the win, uh, so for the win, like when I went out there, 
I had a few friends um, going out there and started playing. And before I left my, uh, like, I told my, like, she wasn't that through, uh, uh, enthused that I was missing um, our anniversary, but I'm just like, you know, I don't play that much. You know, this is a huge tournament, like not many tournaments like this is like the main. And she was totally okay with it. Okay. And I went out there and I just wasn't really, I played the 1K kind of, I cashed, um, but I wasn't really feeling it. And I realized I shouldn't really, you know, again, like there's so many other tournaments. I probably shouldn't miss my anniversary. And we're kind of like butting heads a little bit. So I just decided to fly home and spend it with her. And then she's like, you really should go back out. And I'm like, man, I don't want to know if I want to fly back out again. And she's like, no, just go. You should play it. You know, it's, it's literally like the main. So, and then I ended up flying back out and, and playing it awesome. and then flying right back home. Okay. All right. Um, so given your success, uh, many many aspiring players look up to you, obviously. Have you had any mentors, individuals who influenced you, um, your approach to the game, and how do you stay updated on the evolving poker strategies? Uh, two of my uh, close friends now today uh, were people I really looked up to when I was younger getting into poker. Uh, one is Tony Gargano, who probably no one knows besides, you know, Vegas regulars. He lives, just plays mostly higher stakes cash games in Vegas. He'll dabble in tournaments. But when I was like 15, 16 years old or whenever I got, I think I was like 16 when I got to 1020, he was already playing 1020. And I didn't know who he was. And we played a ton of hands against each other. We were two regulars. And at one point my friend was like, hey, uh, I'm going to my friend's house, like uh, Tony or whatever, you you know, you play against him online. You should, He's he was like five or six years older than me. I think like five years. He's like, you should come over and, you know, meet him and play uh, this home game. So I went over there, played this one, two home game. I was more just introduced, like more like curious about this guy. Like who's this guy I play with the 10, 20 all the time. <laughs> and then like we became friends after that and like talked all the time and like kind of shared, like this was also during an era where there wasn't any really like card runners and those sites that would teach were like your basically tools to learn. Like right. it wasn't like these bots and programs mm -hmm. and like things that you can just input. So he was like someone that I'm like playing the same stakes as me, having success like me. I can run, you know, hands by him or things right. like that and talk with him. And so he was one. And the other one was Dean Hamrick. He uh, he actually took 10th the year before uh, I did in the main event. Okay. So the year prior, he took 10th. He also won a bracelet. He's he's an absolute sicko. Like uh, he he absolutely crushes online um, PLO high stakes. And he was another one of those guys that – same with Tony. He's around Tony's age and just someone I met like that played higher stakes and became friends with and met the first year at the World Series and so still close with. And those are probably my two like guys I really looked up to uh, playing when growing up. OK. Did you ever have like your own coaching site or just program um, or anything like that? Or did you ever uh, help out any of your close friends? Yeah, I, um, it's, it's kind of funny. Um one of my one of my friends, uh, he uh, one of my close friends, he he knew I was always really successful at poker and I was good at poker and he was kind of getting into poker. I was I was like, I think, 18 or 19 at the time. And he said he won like a, a seventy five dollar like token, uh, like a satellite to play a seventy five dollar tournament online. He's like, so like, can I come over there and play? And, you know, you maybe tell me like what I'm doing wrong or right. Or, so he comes over, plays, he like takes like third or fourth for a few thousand. Nice. And then. For like every day for like two months, he comes over and just watches me plays, asks questions the whole time. I, I told him it's okay. And I, I told him to come over, you know, so it wasn't like it was bothering me. And he sure. didn't play at all. He just sat there every day, watched, asked questions, really like took it to heart. And then uh, he started playing himself and uh, he turned his 3K into like six figures in like no time. And, nice. you know, he plays professionally to this day. Awesome. Um, but he really did not know much about poker at all until he really came over for like a month or two and just watched me nonstop. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, I, then I coached my, uh, um, my horde, like a uh, couple of people I stake that I teach. Um, okay. I've had a lot of requests, uh, uh, coaching for money, but I don't know. I've always felt weird about coaching people for money. I've never done it. I, I just feel weird taking people's money and especially like what some of these people charge and, I don't feel comfortable doing it. And, okay. um, but I, I've done things where like, um, so I do this cruise every year that I, I help run for a Norwegian cruise line. I've been Perfect. doing it for like seven years now. And I do, a, um, they have like a tournament series, but I do a class on there 
uh, for a couple hours than I've done the WSOP Academy before. But that's like the most I've done, like in terms of a broad coaching scale. Are you doing the Norwegian cruise this year as well? Yeah, every year. Okay. It's it's a gold mine. It's 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 crazy. <laughs> okay. Where do they travel to? It's mostly the Eastern or Western Caribbean. So I, the first year I did it, I'm like, oh, free cruise. Like, you know, they're paying me for the cruise and, you know, mm-hmm. buying it. So I'm like, I like cruises. So I went and after the first year, I'm like, I can't miss this cruise ever again. Like, wow. this is crazy. Like, this is like the world's best secret. And I think I've been doing it for like 11 years now. And there hasn't been a year I haven't made at least 20,000 on the ship. Uh, I chopped the main one year for 105K. I've won a lot of side events. I've crushed the cash game. It's it's not real poker. It's it's crazy. Like you like honestly, it's it's literally the softest you'll ever see in your life. (laughs) Okay, I've been all over the world. I've been in Africa. I've been in Brazil. I've been everywhere. Like this is these. So what they what happens is like they'll run like cruises all year round, and the region will run these like super turbo satellites. So it's like 160 bucks or 150 bucks table of ten. You when you're buying a cruise or whatever. And so you get all these people that are just kind of average cruise goer or your retirees that they're really, and they, you know, hop in a poker tournament and they win a satellite to play this main event come in December. So you get all these people. And first off, there's always like a hundred K that is in like dead money that people don't show up because a lot of people are like, they win, they win these satellites from all over the place, like in Europe and everything. And they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go, whatever. So there's always like an extra like 90 K or hundred K in the prize pool. You get people that are, some people are just ready to bust right away to go enjoy the cruise or whoever they brought who don't even care at all. And then you got people that really don't know poker, like at like, so you see some of the most crazy hands ever, like the, the hands <laughs> don't even miss some of the hands. So um, it's something I can't miss ever. It's just okay. too good. Okay. All right. Awesome. I won the high roll this year. The, it was funny uh, with uh, heads up. I got heads up in the 2,500 this year and, uh, First place was 56K, uh, $250. And second place was, I think, 37 or 38K. Okay. The guy offered me 54.5 if I would chop heads up. And he got like 38 or 39. So yeah, <laughs> 1K. Okay. And then one time uh, I was playing, uh, I think it was the $200 rebar or the 500. And there was like four or five people left. And I was like fourth in chips. Okay. And the whole table wanted to do a deal and they agreed to give me first like i didn't even ask for it they're like you can have first place since you're the most experienced i'm like okay like they make the craziest deals on the ship too like no one wants to play it out ever so they will make the crazy like the main event this year first place was like uh 200 or 205 second place was like 140 so on so on well at the final nine people they all agreed that everyone makes 70k and first place so they took the first place prize first money out of it all the mm-hmm everything out besides second they paid everyone 70k and they played for first place which was 140k so there was two payouts at the final table 140k 70 70 70 70 all flat they get down to four people for i don't know how the chip leaders ever agree to stuff like that yeah they do uh they got down to four people and then they all agreed to give the chip leader five uh they all agreed to take five extra k and so the chip leader paid him 15k and he got 125 and they all got 75. i'm like you already guaranteed 70. It's 5K to win a possible 70 more. And you're, there's only three people you got to get through. And they're all take the deal. Like it's, it's the deals are crazy there. It and, sounds like it's a bunch of people that don't necessarily need the money. They're just there for the, the vacation and the entertainment. Oh, no, they, they, uh, some don't need the money, but a lot, it's the situation comes down to like no one's used to playing for this kind of money. Oh, okay. no one's public players. And everyone's stress levels, anxiety, and like, they don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to bust. They don't want to like, they, they're just like, let's, let's, I can win right now. Let's just make a deal kind of type thing. It's like, they're just happy to like not lose basically. Like, okay. I, um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Like one year I was at the final table and this is just, I'll just say one hand, but I could say a million hands, but, uh. <laughs> everyone was so there's me and two guys that were all around 35 big blinds 30 to 40 big blinds and then the rest of the table had less than eight so there's three big chip leaders everyone else is on crumbs so it's kind of like don't get in a, in a big pot with these two unless you have the nuts that's right. basically what comes up right and i had this hand where i opened kings like second or third to act this old guy who's like 70 some years old he calls in the cutoff big blind calls 
all three chip leaders, all three mm -hmm. of us. I can't. <laughs> Hawkins, 10, 9, 8. Big blind checks. I check, just trying to keep pot control. Mm -hmm. uh, the cutoff bets like three big blinds. The big blind now goes all in for 36 big blinds. And I easily fold Kings. It's a no brainer for me. Yeah. Like there's so hard for him not to have two pairs set straight. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just, it's easy fold. Okay. The other guy calls, the other guy calls it off with a pair of fours, 10, nine, eight board. And this is just see the stuff. So he took ninth place being like second in chips, <laughs> betting three big blinds and calling off 30 some big blinds with fours on eight, nine, 10. And this is just stuff you see nonstop at the table. Like the same guy would, he would, he would put chips in the pot and then he would take his hand and put it in the middle of the table to the dealer. And the dealer would take his cards half the time. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. One time he may have seen like he said he had aces, which I believed him because so many times he got his chips mucked and his cards right. mucked. Mm -hmm. And this time he's only, he finally made a scene about it. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, I had aces, blah, blah, Like, dude, you can't put your cards in the middle of the table. Like right. you're giving them to the dealer. Mm -hmm. So right. it's, it's it, no one really knows what they're doing. It's kind of funny. It's, it's, you feel bad at, like, I, I, this is the first time I ever felt bad playing poker because the first year on the cruise, there was this one guy that was just, he looked like Albert Einstein. Oh, yeah. He was so excited to play with me. I, I saw him out in the, uh, uh, we were in Cancun or whatever at the beach. And he, I look over and this guy's staring at me. And, you know, I look away, look away, look back. And the guy's staring at me still, you know, look away, look away, look back. And he's still staring at me. I'm like, all right, this is awkward. I kind of have to say something. Hey, how's it going? He's like, he's like, you Joe, you Joe Cata. I go, yeah. He's like, can I get a picture? And you know, he's in this like nice suit. His wife is like, has the big top hat, the long sleeves. Like they're like super, like what you see in the movie. Yes. And uh, take a picture with them. And then he's like, you play poker later? I go, yeah, I'm gonna be. He's like, so oh, can I play with you? I go, yeah, yeah. Come we'll play cash games later. I get back on the ship, and you know, the guy sees me right away. He has this giant ass like professional photo already printed out. He's like, can you sign? I'm like, okay. And then I started playing with this guy, and he's. I could tell he really never played poker and he was just kind of happy to play with me. Right. And I really felt, I, I never felt like really bad at the table. I felt bad because I felt like everyone, like no one was good at the table, but I felt like everyone was taking advantage of this guy. Mm -hmm. Like he, he would do whatever you told him to do. And he would do things that were just stupid. And like, yeah. for example, like there's this one hand that the board was ACE nine, seven, seven, five. And I bet $600 on the river. I have, you know, it doesn't matter what I have. I had an ACE though. Yeah, and he calls me with four three, playing the board on an ace nine seven seven five board. So if I had six high, I win. I'm bluffing with six high, I win. He goes, I just want to see what you have. Mm -hmm. There's another hand where I bet five thousand dollars in a two hundred dollar pot, and he called. Oh and my word! So it's like you can do things like you can just like get kings or aces, and you're like eight hundred to go. You know, at five ten, it'll be like call, call, call. Yeah. It's like, you just, I, I don't think I ever bluff on the ship. I just sit there and just wait for a good hand and make it like 30 times the blind or mm -hmm. whatever the pot, you make it huge. And he's always like, Joe, you play it very secure. I go, <laughs> yeah, every floor, there's like six ways to every flop. And like, like, why would I ever bluff at this table? And like, this guy ended up losing like 150 K at 510. Oh, but apparently like this guy was just loaded because yeah. he took us up to his room. He had the nicest room on the ship grabbed all his alcohol, brought it back downstairs from his room and he booked two rooms the next year already. But why did you book two rooms? He goes, this way when wife's mad at me, I got second room. Wow. I'm like, but you get a lot of wealthy guys that like just throw money around on this. It's, it, the cruise is unbelievable, honestly. Okay. Well, if you see me at a Norwegian cruise. You should come this, when you're, this, let me this. know. You can find also, here's another thing is like, you can find the cruise packages online. So like cruise forums or Reddit or whatever it may be. Like, so people are like, Hey, I can't make this. I want the satellite, the screws and stuff like that. I can't make it. So you can get like the buy-in for the main event, which is like 1150 and a full cruise paid for room and everything for like a thousand bucks. So you can buy the whole package less than the actual buy-in of the tournament because people are just trying to get rid of their satellites. Holy and I, I all the time. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for the tip. I might have to edit this out so nobody else hears. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but this, that's awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that would be awesome for me to because think about it. Or a player like myself, a recreational player. Number one, I'm not playing an event that you're going to be playing. More than likely, unless you're playing at the World Series of Poker and you maybe want to play like a, a 1500 or 5K whatever, for whatever reason. Oh, yeah, I play the small ones. I'll play the 300s, the 500s, the 1000s. Okay. I, like okay. I like those massive fields. Okay. But the, the likelihood of me actually playing in one of these events, yeah. 
sitting at the table with you, and it will probably be later on in the tournament, and I don't have, I'm not going to have an edge. But this, I literally would have an edge against the other players and maybe have an opportunity to play against you at the final table. So that would be an awesome experience and a vacation at the same time. That's a, it's a win-win. There's like, there's like three pros in the tournament. Like, everyone else is just a complete casual. Like, okay. maybe there's a few other – like, maybe a few other pros, but there's no more than, like, ten people that knows what they're doing out of the thousand players at the tournament. Right. That's a, wow. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Everyone's like, Oh, you always, you know, it's, you got to stop telling people. I'm like, no one ever comes like, and it's always <laughs> so easy. It doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were like, no, keep the money here. Keep the money here. Don't tell yeah. <laughs> For real. Yeah. Um, so, so I left these, the last two questions, this is really what I wanted to hit on. Um, and I don't want to talk about myself too much, but, I get to these points where I get deep in tournaments and it's like, oh, like it's it's here. The, I'm finally here. This is a chance of the big one. And sometimes it's either just excitement or just like nerves. I'm just sometimes I, it's just too much for me. And then I just don't perform well. So playing poker at your highest stakes uh, often comes with immense pressure. So how do you manage that stress and pressure during critical moments in the tournament? And do you have any specific techniques or rituals to help you stay composed? Yeah. So like, um, obviously the more you get there, the more comfortable you're going to be and experience does play a part, but good thing about poker is, um, it's not like any other sport where, you know, you're on the spot, you can do something, make a big mental mistake or do something really like, uh, the best thing for to do in like those high pressured spots or those big spots Mm -hmm. is just eliminate everything. It's, It's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be like, blah, blah, blah. But make sure your play is not like, so it's okay to be nervous inside or whatever, but just totally break down the game of how you always break it down and how you always play and make your decisions, how you always make them. And don't, don't let the, the situation like influence you. Should I say like, uh, like my friend, he would never, he always tells me about it. He will never, he never lives this down. And it happens to a lot of people. It's, it's, it's a very common thing where, he was, he was in the deep biggest spot of his, his poker career. He was probably down in the final 15 people in a massive 1500 WSOP event. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he got in a hand against Lonnie Harward, who we're actually friends with now. Okay. And he played the hand so fast and he made, he bluffed all in on the river, like not realizing he got caught up in the situation. He kind of like whatever excuse he told himself, like, right. Oh, we got to bluff quick here because you know, she. You know, some people just do things too fast because like, oh, you know, they're going to think I'm bluffing all that. Whatever stupid thing they talk themselves into. Yeah. Instead of being like, OK, this is the situation. Take your time. You have all the time in the world. People give you time, especially the bigger you get into tournaments or further you get. OK, it, it's OK to bluff. But is this a good bluff? What sure. is, you know, what does my opponent have? What do they think I have? Like, do they think I'm on tilt? Is my opponent calling too much? So really just break down the game and ignore the stakes, the mm-hmm. pressure. Just be like, OK. Is this a hand I should be raising in this situation? Don't be like, okay, I got King Jack. This hand's like kind of like a tight hand, like uh, I'm in middle position. You know, I could just fold this and, you know, play something easier and not shot. No, if, if King Jack's the hand you raise, you know, raise the King Jack, you know, and just because someone calls you a good player, be like, okay, what is their range? And how often should I continue? And just play your game. Like you, okay. you have all the time in the world. Just Just sit there and think it out. Don't let the... Try not to let the pressure get to you. And right. the biggest thing is if you lose chips, I think that's where really people start going off the wheels is yeah. like, is when they start getting short or they lose a big pot and they like, they just get down on themselves. Yes. They're like, I, I, I don't have any chips anymore. It's like, okay, well, play how you would normally play a 15 big blind stack. Don't have to force it. Just play what you think is the correct way to play right. and kind of take away all the. So, like, when, when I was at the main event final table when I won, you yeah. know, there's five people left in the main and uh shulman raises and i have 15 big blinds or 14 big blinds and i look down at threes and i'm like five-handed i'm like okay what what hands is he raising what hands is he folding what hands is he calling with and i started thinking about it i'm like so i play with shulman two days he's gonna raise all his ace suited he's gonna be raising his king jacks his king queens his ace jacks his ace tens his pairs you know so i started thinking about all the hands he's raising and just because he's a tight player, he's still raising these hands. Like he may right. play tighter in different spots, but his opening range, like if he looks at King Queen or Ace 10, he's not folding his hands. I played with him two days. So I'm like, okay, he has all these hands. Now I'm like, what hands is he going to call with if I shove here? 
And I saw earlier in the in the tournament where he opened the button and he had like, I don't know how many big blinds he had, like 20 some bigs. Mm -hmm. And Phil Ivey shot for like 16 or 17 bigs and he folded in pocket nines. Okay. Opened the button, folded for 16 bigs with pocket nines. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, this guy's this guy will fold ace jack. This guy will fold eight, right. seven, nines. You know, he's gonna call me with tens plus ace king. Mm -hmm. Ace queen might be close for him. Who knows? Even ace queen. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, ace king, ace queen's calling me. That's 32 hand combinations. And I started thinking about the hand combinations from 10 to aces. And then I'm like, all these hand combinations that are folding. Yeah. And I'm thinking about how big the pot is and how much I'm, you know, making if he folds. I'm making 25, I'm chipping up 25%. So in my eyes, I'm like, this is an easy shove. Like I could get blinded on, I might never have a hand. Like I might get down to eight big blinds. I have to double up to get right back where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, online i have no problem shoving you know a small pair I'm like just because there's eight million dollars on the line I'm like fuck it you know threes is a shove it's a shove and you know he raises i shove he tanks and ends up calling with jacks he didn't even want to call with jacks like he ended up calling but I'm like how often is he having jacks and everyone's looking like oh my god this kid just shoved threes for the main event it's like we're playing for 23 hours at that final table and it's all <laughs> condensed into 40 minutes of commercial or right. an hour footage with commercials so they're going to portray any, I'm not saying I didn't get lucky, but they're going to portray any story they want in that 23 hours. Right. I mean, it's a story, it's a movie. It's like, yes. you got characters, you know, they pick out what hands they want to show. Like when I got down to three, three big, I was down to three big blinds. They even show my double ups. Okay. Like they fast forward hands, you know, it's just okay. like, there's so much stuff that's skipped out of that coverage. Right. But uh, that's the thing is like, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't have fear. You just had to do what you think is correct, even okay. if it's a high pressure situation. Okay. And that's one thing I've always been successful at is like not caring about the situation and just doing what in my gut that I think is the correct play. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know that's going to help a lot of people as well. And uh, final question, advice for aspiring poker players. So for those who are looking to climb the ranks in the poker world, especially against uh, the toughest opponents, and toughest competition, what advice would you give to aspiring players who aim to reach the highest levels of the game um, while staying true to themselves? I think, uh, I think not enough people um, start off at the appropriate stakes. Like okay. um, people, you can get into poker and be new to poker and without really like seriously, like, like, having like a gambling problem or whatever, like you can play five cent, 10 cent, 10 cent, 25 cent. And that never, that will never limit you from being successful in poker. Mm -hmm. So like when my, when my wife started online, like when she put $40 online, when I started online, when I put $50 online, when I put $600 on UB, you know, I, you know, I started playing 50 cent dollar, obviously 600, you want more than that, but I had more than that. But anyway, there's like, once you figure out like the game and you're successful and you can, you could continue to show like, uh, you know, repeat like that you're winning. Yes. And then you can move up stakes and then you can try that, that level and you can start sharpening your game even more. So like getting the hands in and just getting the experience in and the practice in is literally the most important thing. So if you say you start off, say you jump into online right now and you, you're like, Oh, 50 cent dollar one, two, isn't, you know, isn't that big? Like, but also you lose five buy-ins a thousand dollars for a casual player. You're like, you might that might stop you from playing online poker again, like right. or it may stop you from playing for two months. You get two hundred dollars, you play five cent, ten cent. You could play two months all the time and just right. get so much hands in, and and it's just so important to get the hands in, like right. just getting the practice in, getting the hands in. Anything in life, anything in life, you look at the people that are most successful, the people that are the best at what they do is just because they put in the time, they put in the practice. That's right. whatever you're not you're not born in anything like you're not the best at anything you everything comes with work and and practice so that's the biggest thing about poker and i would say like i would i would probably equivalent like i would give out 80 percent to playing and 20 percent to studying or maybe even higher 85 15 but you should really be putting in the hands and playing a lot of hands to get if you really want to like to become a better poker player okay all right awesome uh, this has been absolutely amazing. I know I learned a lot. I'm fired up. I'm ready to go to Tunica tomorrow and, and really, well, definitely going to rewatch this a million times, write down uh, the biggest takeaways and definitely get my mind right um, and get ready for Tunica. So I really appreciate it. I know the viewers are going to really appreciate this. So Joe, thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you for having me. And if you have any questions ever, like in poker or whatever, reach out to me, you know? My man, thank you. I, uh, 
this is awesome. I couldn't uh, I couldn't imagine a better way to start my year. So thank you so much. I I truly appreciate this. I appreciate you too. And you know, if you make it out to Vegas this summer, hit me up. All right, we'll do. We'll do. Thank you so much. Um, so right, until next time, guys. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. Keep it posted. Hopefully, we have uh, Joe on another time and we can talk about him winning uh, another WSOP main event, whether he goes this summer or whatever may be in the fold in the future. So until next time, thank you.